Welcome to Modern Aikido's podcast. My sincere thanks to listeners and those who have liked, subscribed, and commented. Your interest is noticed and deeply appreciated. If there is a constant nagging pain of being an Aikido practitioner, it's hearing the constant stream of excuses why Aikido is not functional or practical as a martial art. In today's podcast, we go through the most common ones and find out which ones are valid and which ones are justifications for poor performance. It may sting to hear this, but Aikidoka are pretty well known for having all kinds of excuses for why their Aikido isn't capable. Some are so bad as to be downright ridiculous. We have to own up to this truth. When called on it by people who are experienced in fighting and martial arts, a nearly endless cascade of excuses and double talk usually follows. Some is on point and valid, but much of it is merely justification for lack of effectiveness. If Aikido is to step up and show its potential, we as Aikido practitioners must purge ourselves of the nonsense excuses and spiritual psychobabble. Indulging in insults towards those who criticize us shows nothing more than an admission that the criticisms are correct and reflects poor character. As Socrates wrote, when the debate is lost, slander becomes the tool of the loser. We must be better than that. If we are to represent Aikido, or even just ourselves, we must make our arguments and comments intellectually sound, just like our martial art should be martially sound. It should be obvious, but I'll state it anyway. What I present here are my thoughts and perspectives, and are my opinions. I do not claim that my views are objective facts, or represent the opinions of any other person. As you listen, I invite you to think for yourself to find out what you believe is true and what makes sense to you. Hopefully what I present will provide you some good food for thought, and I openly welcome other perspectives and ideas which might be better. My goal in presenting this material is to help us put the justifications to bed and find the best answers to those who question what we do. Aikido practices and habits are not free from fault. In many cases, criticisms are quite accurate. They should motivate us to improve our training and abilities, not find more excuses or justifications as to why Aikido is not practical or useful. The truth can sting, but accepting it makes us stronger. Denying the truth or hiding from it only keeps us weak. We must each think for ourselves, of course, but that doesn't mean we should not share ideas to see which ones rise and emerge as the best. Poor ideas should be abandoned. When we set aside our pride and ego, we can look objectively at ourselves and our art to see the problems and address them. I will be speaking frankly, and some of what I have to say may not sit well with some people. If something hits close to home, give it serious thought. Solid criticism is the first step in abandoning poor practices and improving yourself. Doing so makes you stronger, smarter, and more capable. Here are 10 responses to common criticisms of Aikido, which serve as explanations for why Aikido is not effective, practical, or useful. I've compiled these from my memory with the help of some others who have offered great suggestions from things they had heard. This is not an exhaustive list of all the excuses floating around out there, but it covers the majority of them. So without further ado, let's knock them down one by one. Number one, Aikido is not a martial art, so the fact that it is not useful for fighting or self-defense is not important. Variations of this include that Aikido is a philosophy, a way of life, a moving meditation, or a spiritual pursuit, so its usefulness as a martial art is not the point. As with understanding anything, defining terms is a necessary first step. What does martial art mean? The origin of the word martial is Mars, the Roman god of war. Martial means, quote, of, relating to, or suited for war or a warrior, according to dictionary definition. A martial art is related to warfare and combat. Looking at Aikido from a 10,000-foot view, its heritage comes from Daitaru Aiki Jiu-Jitsu, and going back farther than that, Jiu-Jitsu, and Taijutsu, or body art, prior to that. The history of Aikido and all martial arts all over the world is human combative behavior. In the West, the term for this is hoplology. In the last 200 years, martial arts and fighting have evolved into very different things. Sports, entertainment, fitness and exercise, and other manner of activities and pastimes. At its core, though, Aikido is a martial art. It clearly was to Osensei, although he was also a very religious man. His faith heavily influenced his Aikido, but is that influence necessary for martial excellence? I believe the answer is no, the reason being that you didn't need to follow Omoto, which was Osensei's religion, to be a man of peace or benevolence. Omoto cannot claim a monopoly on treating other human beings with respect. If Osensei's religion was embedded into Aikido, 
then could a devout Christian never understand Aikido? How about a Taoist or a Hindi? What part of the martial art of Aikido requires practitioners to follow the Omoto religion? I believe no part of Aikido requires dedication to the Omoto religion. There are some dojos which require practitioners to be of the same faith. This is extremely rare, though. I've only come across one such dojo, and it wasn't Aikido, it was karate. I've not been to an Aikido dojo with such a policy, nor have I heard of one. Most martial arts schools tend to be secular and allow students of any religion to attend and practice. Back to the point, the statement that Aikido is not a martial art is inaccurate. It very clearly was a martial art during Osensei's lifetime. That is, it was well suited to self-defense and to have an excellent chance to prevail in hand-to-hand -hand combat. I believe this is where calling Aikido a philosophy, religion, meditation, or spiritual pursuit is using incorrect words. Changing word definitions around does nothing more than create confusion. Many musicians describe playing music as a spiritual experience. That doesn't mean playing music as a religion. It could be called a meditation of sorts. However, in the case of music, the musician can view music as being spiritual, a meditation, or some other thing, but at the end of the day he is still playing actual music. Another analogy that fits pretty well to the study of martial arts is that of a hunter. Someone can be an excellent marksman with a rifle, but there is far more to game hunting than being a good target shooter. Being able to hit a target with a rifle is an aspect of hunting. At a shooting range, the target is across a flat and level field with no obstructions and a set range to the target. Skill in understanding the rifle is necessary to be a good target shooter. In the field, a successful hunter needs to be able to fire from odd positions behind cover, being skilled at estimating correct range to the target, being able to perform when cold and tired, as well as many other aspects which don't exist on a target range. Those who delve into deep academic studies of martial arts often fall victim to being hyper-focused on one aspect of hand-to-hand -hand fighting to the exclusion of many others. Almost all martial arts have this problem to some degree or other, especially with aspects of hoplology which are not included in their art. A clear example is boxers who don't train to deal with kicks or takedowns, for example. Why would a boxer train to deal with those as they are illegal in boxing? Training them would be a waste of valuable training time and would not serve him in a boxing match. Redefining Aikido as something other than a martial art is a poor approach. I can take up baking cakes and call it Aikido, but that doesn't make it Aikido. Clearly, baking cakes is a far different than what Osensei did and taught as Aikido, which was a martial art. A rose by any other name is still a rose. Calling a frog a rose doesn't make it one. One might even be able to envision a scenario which I might creatively use a cake or my knowledge of baking to convince an attacker not to harm me. Using mental gymnastics to assert that it might be possible doesn't make baking a self-defense art. Number 2. Osensei was awesome and his Aikido was powerful, so Aikido is powerful. The same sentiment holds true for Tohei, Shiota, Chiba, and many other notable Aikido practitioners and instructors. It is true, by all accounts, Osensei was amazing and his Aikido was extremely capable. Likewise, Tohei, Shiota, Nishio, and many other primary students of Osensei were also extremely competent. Remember this, though. They proved it many times by putting their Aikido to the test. Being a student of a capable instructor only gives you access to learn. It doesn't mean that you have their skill or ability. The fact that your teacher is amazing doesn't make you amazing. Trying to impress someone by invoking the name of your teacher or art is no substitute for being able to show Aikido's effectiveness with your own performance. Instead, it comes across as an attempt to ride on the coattails of someone else's reputation. I've found that competent athletes and martial artists can smell this from a mile away and tend to view it as a pathetic attempt at being relevant. It's fine to show respect for those in your lineage, but always remember that your Aikido is yours, not theirs. They may have been impressive, but the burden of showing Aikido being potent and effective lies on your shoulders alone. Your instructor and fellow students can help guide you to it, but it's all up to you as to how good you are at it. Number 3. Aikido is the study of principles, not application. Every martial art is the study of principles. In fact, it's not just martial arts, it's every art and every science. They are all a study of principles. You're not really an artist until you can put the principles together in application. To use the music analogy, you can learn chords and play scales endlessly, but that doesn't mean you can play music. Chords and scales convey principles, but are not in and of themselves music. 
they contain aspects of it. From a martial perspective, being able to explain or demonstrate principles well doesn't necessarily mean you can perform them under pressure in a live dynamic situation. You could call these two different approaches academic understanding versus practical understanding. Academic is the ability to talk about it. Practical is the ability to do it. The best analogy I've found so far to explain this is to see a magician perform a trick. Most people viewing it don't know how the magician makes the card disappear from the deck and appear in their own back pocket. The audience is astounded by this remarkable performance. The academic may study and discover how the magician does the trick. They find out the setup which is necessary as well as the sleight of hand and misdirection the magician uses to fool the audience. Just because you know how the trick is done doesn't mean you can perform that trick yourself. It takes practice and honed skill to successfully perform the trick. I believe a vast majority of the martial arts world, particularly practitioners of arts which have no competitive or dynamic venue to express their art, fall into the academic category. There are many arts like this, and Aikido is certainly one. Kenji Tamiki has been credited with trying to solve this problem by conceiving of Aikido's randori. Some styles of Aikido practice randori and others do not. Randori in Aikido tends to be multiple ukes attacking a single person, who acts as nage with the goal of surviving for a period of time. This randori can take on many different flavors, with attacks or speed being somehow limited. I believe Tamiki designed a pretty solid training exercise in what he created. If we look at how the military and high-level police, such as SWAT, trains, they set up particular scenarios to help train their personnel in how to assess different environments and behaviors. They go farther in training in reality than martial artists do, and I believe that there is value there. Perhaps something to think about as you are setting up training for your students. In a randori, the principles you learn should come out. It's the application of them which is important. It is in randori when you learn the intricacies of performing the magic trick. Number four, you don't see Aikido in sport fights. If only I had a nickel for every time I've heard the claim that you don't see Aikido in sport fights like UFC, I'd be a wealthy man. The claim is partially true and partially false. The true part is that Aikido is not about starting fights or putting yourself in harm's way unnecessarily. I'll get deeper into that point when I break down another excuse, though. The false part of the claim is that Aikido techniques themselves are not seen in sport fights. They are, and quite a lot of them. They just don't look pretty like they do in demonstrations. Demonstrations are not reality. Real fights are far more chaotic. Demonstrations are cleaned up to do two things. One, to clearly show the fundamental concepts of how a technique works. And two, to make it pleasing to watch. A real fight is so messy that unless you know what you're looking for, there isn't a great deal to see. This is why slow motion replays combined with expert commentary are so common. They are used to help people who cannot see or understand what just happened. There are a number of compilation videos on YouTube which show sport fighters applying techniques used in Aikido and comparing the footage of the sport fight, then showing the demonstration version of the exact same technique. The demonstrations tend to look pretty sterile, and the fight footage version is far messier. This is what it is. There are many instances of Aikido techniques being used in sport fights, so that claim is blatantly false. The typical response to that statement is that the fighter in question wasn't trained in Aikido, therefore he wasn't using Aikido. The techniques Aikido uses are not unique to it. The throws, locks, and controls appear in other arts as well as go back for centuries. They exist and have for a long time because they are effective. The fact that they appear in sport fights is a testament to that fact. Number 5. Aikido is too effective, which is why many Aikido techniques are illegal in sport fighting. A variation of this is that Aikido is meant for deadly combat with no rules. The part of these claims that are true is that Aikido does not have a sport rule set integrated with it. An example of an art that does is Judo. Within the Judo community, there is considered two strains of Judo, sport and defense. A particular dojo may specialize in one over the other or teach an understanding of both. The sport side is far more limited, with techniques being removed for safety and to make competition more viewer-friendly. Osensei voiced his concern about approaching his art in this way. Even Jigoro Kano had similar concerns about Judo. In the end, I believe this approach is a double-edged sword. The good side is that competition builds solid skills with applying technique against someone who is actively trying to attack you. Another good aspect of the sport application is that it is a fun activity which attracts attention and will attract students. 
If you look at the birth and growth of judo from its small beginnings to becoming an Olympic event, I think it's pretty obvious that competition has a great deal to do with the remarkable growth of judo and why it is so widespread even today. The claim that many Aikido techniques are illegal in sport fighting are untrue. There are those in the sport fighting world who have done breakdowns of this particular claim by listing off the specific rules of many MMA sports to find exactly where the line is drawn. I believe Ramsey Dewey, who has a great channel, did a video on this. The first rule Aikidoka tend to argue is the small joint manipulation restriction. The rules which cover small joint manipulation describe them merely as fingers and toes. Locks to the wrists, ankles, or elbows are all allowed. This means Nikyo is not illegal. Yubidori or finger techniques are not legal, but most Aikido styles don't practice or use Yubidori. In fact, I've heard Aikidoka slam such techniques as being not Aikido because they are painful. Don't get me started on the whole that's not Aikido thing. I'm not going to list off every rule for sport fights, but Aikido throws are all legal. Here are a few of the major rules which come to mind. One rule is no 12 to 6 strikes to the top of the head. Where exactly is that taught in Aikido? Another is no striking the back of the neck or head. Again, Aikido doesn't teach much of this. Striking is something pretty rare in Aikido, with many Aikidoka believing striking of any kind is distasteful. More on that point in a bit. The last part of debunking this claim is in regards to the no rules part. The insinuation is that unless eye poking or eye gouging, kicking the groin, biting, or other such brutality is not allowed, then it's not real enough. The truth is that these illegal attacks are really not part of the Aikido curriculum. While there are people who are much better scholars at Aikido's history than I am, I have yet to see any Aikido source endorse this kind of brutality. A vast majority of Aikidoka I've met tend to get squeamish at the idea of striking an uke, much less biting them or gouging eyes. At best, I've seen it mentioned as something you may consider if you have no other option, but these things are not integral to Aikido itself. Number 6. Aikido is so complex that no one really knows it well enough to be a good representative of it. This excuse is probably the most subtle and difficult to dispute in an argument. The reason is that it leaves nowhere for a critic to go. The problem is that using this argument, you are presenting a claim that Aikido is a powerful and effective art and admitting there is no evidence or validation to act as proof of it. The result is it comes across like hollow boasting. Most commonly, the next step in presenting this point is to jump back to point number two I made above, which was to say that Osensei was effective and capable, so the art itself is. What happens when the results are not replicable? Wouldn't it mean that Osensei was effective, but his art was not? Maybe you could go one step closer by saying that he was effective and his primary students were effective, but their students were not. I don't think this is accurate either. His students clearly learned a method from Osensei, although each had their own variation of it. What they had in common was sound. That doesn't mean that every practitioner has a high level of skill, though. Just as everyone who has taken a lot of music lessons is not a highly skilled musician. Some rise to the top because they have talent. Others have the passion and drive to practice and in time become highly skilled. Many others take up the art because it is fun and they enjoy doing it. And it doesn't matter to them whether they become highly skilled or not. Someone doesn't need to be Eddie Van Halen to enjoy playing the guitar at home. However, he shouldn't be bragging that he and Eddie are the same merely because they play the same instrument. In the end, the assertion that Aikido is so complex that no one really knows it or can show it is a false claim. Almost all martial arts are complex, but not so complex that a few years of dedicated training won't make you pretty decent at them. If you are several years in and don't have much to show for it, then that lies in your instructor and your dojo. Their responsibility is to build those skills in you. It is true that there are dojos out there that don't do a good job of building those skills in their students. I believe they are a disgrace to the art, but that's just me. Aikido isn't the only martial art with that problem. Number 7. Aikido is the art of peace and isn't about fighting. Let's go in order here. Aikido is the art of peace. Osensei said this clearly, so there really is no disputing it. But what exactly does it mean? Is peace the ultimate goal, or is it the process as well as the goal? The ultimate goal of any moral person, that is, anyone who is not a sociopath or a psychopath, is peace. It is the underlying principle behind the Hippocratic Oath, do no harm. It's a noble goal which reflects the best side of humanity, and I fully agree with the intent of do no harm. However, the reality of the world introduces a problem. 
you can have the ultimate goal of doing no harm, but others introduce violence, which is harm or the threat of harm, and unless you are willing to stop them, you will become a victim. It is well proven that in such circumstances, the actions of others may make causing harm to them necessary to save innocent people from harm. That innocent person could be you, or it could be someone else who is too weak or vulnerable to protect themselves. It is frightening to look in the face of violence. In doing so, you will see a combination of anger, viciousness, rage, and a lack of empathy. These are things which can be impossible to stop using peace as a method. I'm not talking about a low level of violence which a wise application of empathy might curb, such as someone in pain who is lashing out. I'll summarize a classic Aikido story in the next point. What I'm talking about here is when the point of being able to negotiate gets passed and the intent to do physical violence is immovable. Adrenaline and rage can push a brain past the point of being able to use or even hear ration and reason. There is a big difference between the ultimate goal and the process. If someone has a severe lower abdominal pain caused by appendicitis, the ultimate goal of the surgeon is the patient's health and comfort. That doesn't mean that he avoids a highly painful and invasive surgery in order to fix it. A good doctor will avoid unnecessary pain and suffering to the patient, but the threat to his safety must be dealt with. Aikido and violence has much the same relationship. The surgery may be ugly and painful, but a good Aikidoka will use only what he must to put an end to it quickly. There is no malice or anger, but it must be handled directly. Just like the surgeon who has the patient's health and well-being in mind. Peace is the goal, not necessarily the method. The method is in using only the necessary and appropriate response to put an end to the threat and ensure safety and peace. That is a complicated thing when you introduce the human factor and the complexities of different circumstances, but the underlying principle is still there. This brings us to the second part of the statement, that Aikido is not about fighting. It is. It is true that Aikido is not about starting physical conflicts or inviting fights where there wouldn't normally be any. However, someone else may choose to initiate violence against you despite your best efforts to avoid it, escape it, or negotiate your way out of it. What happens then is fighting, pure and simple. You either engage in it or you will get overwhelmed and beaten. That doesn't mean you unleash your own adrenaline and rage. My definition of Aikido is not to fight, but to put an end to fighting as quickly and efficiently as possible. Hopefully I can do that verbally or through the use of self-protection skills such as awareness and avoidance. If those don't work, my Aikido training is focused on dealing with the physical with as little risk to me while I put an end to the conflict as quickly as possible. Aikidoka tend to be very smug about claiming some kind of moral high ground when it comes to the whole art of peace and Aikido isn't about fighting thing. The problem there is that virtually all martial artists, at least ones of decent character, which is most of them, abide by the same code. They don't want to start fights or get into fights. They want to avoid fights. They train so they are ready when that choice to start a fight is made by someone else. Aikido has no superior moral claim over any other martial art. Likewise, other martial arts have the goal of peace as well. I think this smugness and air of moral superiority that tends to come from some Aikido practitioners needs to stop. It isn't accurate, and it just makes the Aikido community look snooty and elitist. Number 8. Good Aikido means you avoid physical conflict. Sun Tzu wrote, the supreme art of war is to subdue the enemy without fighting. There is really no disputing that Sun Tzu was a master strategist, and this quote is a testament to the power of excellent strategy. Of course, only a fool gets into a fight if he can find a way to establish peace without fighting. A wise strategist can sometimes accomplish peace without needing to engage in physical conflict. The classic story I mentioned a few minutes ago in regards to using empathy in certain instances to curb violence is expressed in this experience Terry Dobson had many years ago. Terry Dobson is a well-known Aikido practitioner who studied under Osensei as an Uchideshi, which is a live-in student. His story is a rather famous one and covers about five pages. You can look it up online and read the whole thing, but I'll summarize it for you here. Dobson was riding on a train in Tokyo when an unruly drunk started getting aggressive in the train car. His behavior was loud and threatening, although not really to anyone in particular. Dobson, at the time, had about three years of Aikido training consisting of eight hours every day. He was young, in good shape, liked to throw and grapple, yet realized his skills were untested in a real confrontation. His first thought was that this very well may be his chance to give them a try. As Dobson was getting all geared up to teach this drunk a lesson, 
A little old man shouted, Hey! Hey! And both he and the drunk turned to look. The little old man invited the drunk, Come over here and sit down and talk with me. The drunk, even though reluctantly and defiantly, went over and sat down next to the old man. The old man asked him, What you been drinking? And the man answered, I've been drinking some sake. The old man replies back, Oh, that's wonderful. My wife and I enjoy sake too. And he continues on the discussion with the man. The old man keeps a cheery demeanor, and it starts to soften the man's attitude. He told the old man that his wife must be lovely, and the old man responded that his wife had passed away. This further softens and saddens the drunk. Then the drunk man admits that he has no wife, no job, and that he is ashamed of himself. He then breaks down in tears. The old man consoles him and tells him he understands. The incident ends without any physical violence, and the drunk is no longer a threat. This was one of the first stories I heard in regards to Aikido as a non-conventional martial art. I don't doubt for a second that the story is true, and I'm sure it happened exactly as Dobson describes. He ends his story by stating that he just saw Aikido used in real life, and the basis of what made the old man's approach work was love, not the desire for physical conflict that he was feeling inside. In my opinion, what was going on here was that the old man executed an elegant strategy, one which was far better than the strategy Dobson had in mind. Could Dobson have used the same approach? My guess would be probably not. The first reason is that he was in his 20s, not an old man. Older people tend to be viewed as less of a threat than young men are. Just the difference of this one aspect of their appearance is an advantage that the old man had that Dobson didn't. Credit where it is due, the old man's strategy worked and worked brilliantly. We can only speculate whether he eyed up the drunk accurately and consciously saw his opportunity or not. I'd say he probably did, and I'm ready to give him full credit for it. Either way, the proof is in the pudding. I'll also be honest and say that while this story warms the heart, it also doesn't paint an accurate picture of how all violence starts. Would that same or similar approach have worked in a New York subway with teenage gang members? I'd say likely not. We cannot use romantic stories as our basis of understanding violence. We can use them to open our minds to using smart strategies when we see the opportunity to do so. Stories like this remind us not to fall into the trap of having only a hammer and seeing every problem as a nail. And that's a good lesson. Field Marshal Erwin Rommel said, Sweat saves blood, blood saves lives, and brains save both. I believe this quote describes well the importance of both solid training and good strategy when it comes to dealing with violence. Any sensible person wants to avoid violence. The reason we train and train hard is when the time comes when we cannot avoid it, we are fully prepared to have the best chances of surviving it. It is very good to study the skills of awareness, observation, profiling, strategy, and negotiation, even misdirection, cunning, and trickery. However, these are not the things which can really be studied on the mat. At best, you can do very limited training with them. In order to do this, one would need to set up scenarios and run them to build good observation and problem-solving skills. They would require very good actors to make such exercises worthwhile. This is where real-world experience is far better than anything available in training scenarios. Police officers, bouncers, and security personnel tend to have invaluable real-world encounter experience. We can learn a great deal from them. Number 9. Aikido is defensive only. It doesn't include offense and won't work against someone who isn't attacking you. A variation of this is that Aikido only works when someone is really trying to harm you. The idea that Aikido is entirely defensive is incorrect. You could say it is not offensive in that the basic theory is that Aikidoka should not be starting fights or initiating violence. However, to understand this fully, we have to dig a little deeper than merely who threw the first punch. If I approach you with my hands in my pockets and say, give me your money, is that violence? I've not touched you or shown you any compelling reason more than giving you a verbal order. You may or may not consider that order to be a threat. If I had a gun in my belt that you could see, now would our exchange be violence? What if I had no gun, but if I had two friends with me? What if I had no gun or friends and merely said, give me your money or I will kill you? That is pretty clearly violence, which I think almost anyone would agree. It can also be violence when the threat is veiled, such as showing a weapon or having friends surround you. Criminals and lowlifes can be pretty skilled at walking right up to the line of what would be considered violence just to see how their potential victim may respond. Nowadays, they call this finessing a target. If you observe pre-attack cues, 
well enough to determine that violence is imminent and you cannot escape, are you morally bound to wait until a physical attack comes to respond? There are different answers to this question, but my opinion is no. Predators often use subtle maneuvering to get their prey into a position that by the time they execute their attack, their prey is nearly helpless. Remember, thugs don't want to fight. They want to dominate without risk of harm to themselves. The truth is you can either find yourself in a bad situation or be maneuvered into one before you realize it. If this happens, you may have to take decisive action to escape. This means you might have to initiate the physical. Note that in doing so, you didn't initiate the violence. Predators who tried to surround you or introduce threats did that. You are merely having to respond in a manner which is appropriate to secure your safety. It's your judgment which determines what action is appropriate. The Aikido I was taught was through the Tohei lineage, although prior to the later years key society. One of the principles I was taught was Shoto Osezu, which means control the first move. Other styles and organizations of Aikido teach this principle, but I don't know if they all do or not. If you watch films of Osensei, he attacks into approaching ukes, forcing them to respond to him rather than following through with their attack. This is the best example and testament that Aikido is proactive, not reactive in nature. Yet, most modern Aikido is taught as reactive. The fundamental of warfare and combat which describes this is, action beats reaction. I think this is pretty plain and rather indisputable. The other claim is that Aikido only works on those who are really trying to harm you. Back to the guy who stands in front of you with a gun in his belt and his hands in his pockets. He says, give me your money or I will shoot you, and your Aikido won't work? I think that simple scenario pretty much dispels that claim and makes it clear that you would be in the moral right to initiate physical action against him and that Aikido has the necessary tools to control him before he could get to his gun. Number 10. Those who don't study Aikido are ignorant and don't understand it. Of all the excuses I list, this is the one I am most disappointed and disgusted in my fellow Aikidoka for stating. The reason is that it drips with arrogance and elitism. It also feels like it's taking the low road and is a shortcut to ending a conversation they really shouldn't have engaged in in the first place. Let me elaborate a bit because there is a sliver of truth in this response. If you've been on the internet for more than about 20 seconds, you have seen or experienced keyboard ninjas and armchair quarterbacks. What they lack in wisdom or experience, they make up for in being vocal about their opinions. These people tend to flood online forums with their opinions, which are usually made up of some combination of ignorance, argumentativeness, and insults. Engaging with people like this is a waste of time, and calling their behavior out may feel good in the moment, but sinking to their level is a poor strategy. The old saying goes, never wrestle with a pig. You both get covered in crap, and the pig likes it. Another saying that fits is, never play chess with a pigeon. He will knock over the pieces, crap on the board, and fly back to his friends claiming victory. If someone doesn't understand Aikido, it's just rude to tell them they don't understand it. The solution is to guide them to understanding it. If someone isn't ready or isn't interested in learning, just walk away silently. Remember the pig and the pigeon. There is nothing to be gained by behaving as badly as they are, even if you are using more refined language. If they don't understand and show interest in learning, well, that's another story. You should be able to show them what Aikido is capable of and do so cheerfully without coming across like you have a chip on your shoulder. If your art is sound and your skills are good, what do the words of someone who is ignorant really matter? I've found that other martial art practitioners are pretty respectful of other arts and will give them the benefit of the doubt. The reputation Aikido has among people I've met tends to be that there are some Aikido practitioners who are the real deal and others who have no idea what they're doing. Which one of these groups would you prefer to be in? To really understand fighting and hoplology, one must be well-rounded. That means getting exposure to other arts and methods. Failing to do this puts you right back to what this excuse tends to accuse others of, which is being ignorant. Remember, the root of the word ignorance is to ignore. To ignore something means that you have access to the information but choose not to avail yourself of it. Martial arts are present and available almost everywhere. There is no excuse for being ignorant. The solution is to take the initiative to expose yourself to as much as you can. Doing so will make you well-rounded and a competent martial artist. The innovators of the martial arts world did this. The good news is that you can do it too. It does take some work. But if you got into martial arts training expecting it to be easy, what exactly were you thinking? The good news is that expanding your skills and understanding is both fun and empowering. These are my top 10 excuses and my thoughts on them. 
I'd love to see Aikido practitioners do a better job at representing the Aikido community in general. Many already do a very good job, but a vocal minority can make it seem like we are all out of our minds. Those who are wise and have good answers need to be as vocal as those who don't represent Aikido very well. Aikido needs no excuses. If an excuse is necessary, it's because we as individual practitioners have improvements we need to make in our art. Shoring up your skills is time and effort far better spent than arguing or coming up with justifications for why you aren't competent enough. What other topics are you interested in hearing covered in this podcast? Please share your ideas in the comments if you're watching this on YouTube, or go to the Facebook group Aikido the Marshall site and post a comment there. You can also support this podcast by donating either through a monthly sponsorship or through a single donation of any amount you like. I always enjoy hearing from listeners of the show, whether through comments or questions. Thank you all for sharing your interest. Enjoy your training.